Patrick. So uh, last class we had, um, there were some interesting questions that came up that I wasn't quite prepared for at that moment because I didn't want to screw up the explanation and confuse you. So I've, uh, Niall actually asked the question about determining where feasibility is on some constraints. And it's an important question to answer. Um, it's in the current assignment as well. So for those of you that have not yet uh, started your tutorial um, in Monday's section, you'll see that that tutorial today for your group is also the first assignment. Um, and that's due on Thursday. And part of that um, is working through this idea of figuring out which side of a constraint is feasible and which side it is not. Um, as I said last class, it's not too difficult to figure it out, but um, let's just take a look at an example. I'll show a simple constraint, 16x1 plus uh, 10x2 is less than or equal to 1,500. So this constraint actually shows up in the problem we're currently looking at in the handout. But I'm just going to take a look at one constraint. And if you wanted to draw it um, to figure out what it looks like, uh, this might be the way you go about it. So you want to know which side of this constraint you're on. And if you're drawing it, that's the x1 axis is horizontal and x2 axis is vertical. So one, one of the easiest ways to draw it is to just rearrange this temporarily in your mind. This is not what you actually do, but in your mind, just write it as um, 16, oops, sorry, 10x2 is equal to 1,500 minus 16x1. Because we're used to writing it in the form of y equals mx plus c, so that's where I'm heading. Uh, x2 is then 150 minus uh, 1.6x1. So what we notice from that, of course, is that we've got a negative slope. Um, so we've got the minus 1.6 up here, indicating that this line will have this sort of angle. Okay, and uh, where does it uh, cross? Well, it crosses the y-axis. That's the easiest one. It crosses at 150. So you know that point is 150. Where does it cross the x-axis? Um, at x1. Well, that's also easy to figure out. You set x2 equal to 0. When x2 is equal to 0, uh, you can solve for x1 is equal to 1,500 divided by 16. So it crosses at a value of around 93 over here. Okay, So it's very easy to draw this. F find where it intersects one axis, find where it intersects the other axis. It's a straight line. Just join a straight line between those two points. Then the question that uh, Niall asked is, well, how do you know which side of that line is the feasible side? And the other is obviously the infeasible. Um, the easiest way I do it is just to sub in any two numbers. So let's just put in an arbitrary point. Let's just take a point over here, 10 and 10. Okay, so if you sub in uh, x1 equals 10 and x2 equals 10, what's the value there on the left-hand side of the equation? 300, okay? So 16 times 10, no, it's not 300. Uh, it's, it's small. So 16 times 10 plus 10 times 10. Okay, so it's a number that's certainly less than 1,500. Okay, so 10, 10 is a feasible point, and then you don't need to do this for every point, but it's clear then that everything on this side of the line will be feasible. Okay? If you want to verify, Pick a, a point on the other side of the line. Let's pick 100, 100. Okay, so x1 is 100, x2 is 100. That's clearly on this side. It's somewhere up over here. Okay, sub in 100 there, 100 there, you get a number that exceeds 1,500. That's clearly infeasible. So what's standard in uh, this linear programming area is that they'll do this. They'll draw the line and then they'll add an arrow to it that way, indicating the, the feasible side. The other side is infeasible. Okay, so this is the feasible side. Okay, now let's uh, let's just pick up where we were last week. Um, well, maybe before we do that, any questions on this construction? Okay. So where we were last week is we were converting that to slack variables and. We had said that we can add a new variable, so 16x1 plus 10x2. And if we're converting this to slack form, because it's a less than or equal to, we add a slack and set that equal to 1,500. 
Okay. So what I want to ask now is if x1 is 10 and x2 is 10, what is x3? So quickly calculate x3. OK, so TR has got it there. x3 is 1,240. Remember, the properties of slack variables are that they're positive, greater than or equal to 0. Okay? So x3 here is greater than or equal to 0. And that's required for a feasible point. Okay. So it proves yet again that that side of the line is, a feasi is the feasible side. Okay. X3, if, X, if we used a point up here, X3 would be negative. So maybe just you can add a note here. At this point, for example, x3 would be negative. And we know that our slack variables cannot be negative. And again, we would not want to be on that side of the line. OK, and then this naturally leads to the concept of the idea of a slack variable equaling 0. So if x3 is equal to 0, then we must be on the line. Okay, another way to say that is we must be on the constraint. We're right at that constraint. Okay. So slack variables, I mean, it comes from an intuitive interpretation of slack variables. Right, if you take your day, you've got 24 hours in your day, that's your constraint. And you fill it up with sleeping, with studying, and with other activities. If you say to someone, I've got no slack time, you literally have no time to do nothing, right? Every single hour of that day is accounted for. In the same way on a constraint. If a constraint has a slack variable equal to zero, there's no way you can relax that constraint. There's no loosening. There's no room for movement. It, it means that you're right on that bound. Okay, so if you're on this bound, you're somewhere along that line. You've got no capacity to move away from it. Okay, so we're going to see an interpretation of slack variables and, and start to read into that uh, in terms of the example we looked at last class. But I just wanted to recap those important points from last week. Yeah, Khalil. Uh, just to confirm, so once the slack of zero, is the constraint active? Yes. So if x3 is equal to zero, then we must be on the constraint. We say the constraint is active. Okay, so that's the terminology used. Active constraints, and then of course inactive constraints would be the opposite. Okay, yes. I don't understand what you mean by this constraint. It's just the term that we you say. That constraint is active, it means that we're on the line. Okay? If if I'm off the line, let's say I'm at this point. The constraint is inactive. I'm not, I'm not against that barrier. It's just a terminology, active and inactive. Okay. Any other questions before moving on? OK, let's uh, recap the example from last class. So you have page one, two, and three of the handout. Um, so take that out and just like to review the problem we're studying with, and then we're taking it further. So in the class last week, we set up this issue, this case where we're trying to create two products, A and B. And I won't go through the details again, other than to say we're trying to make the most amount of money. And we make $15 of profit for unit B and $10 of profit for unit A. So my objective then is to maximize that joint amount of 10x1 plus 15x2, subject to constraints. And last class, we spent some time converting those 
to standard form. Again, I won't uh, go through it other than to just summarize the matrix form of it, AX equals B. Um, we've got two decision variables, X1 and X2, and then we created three more decision variables, X3, 4, and 5, from our slack variables. So they appear over here. You've got to be very comfortable creating this representation from the original representation. That should be um, second nature almost. So AX equals B in this system, A, your matrix AX would be equal to 16, 10, 4 for the first column related to X1, 10, 12, and 8 for the second column, and then 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. I'm realizing the people there on that side can't see the board. Sorry about that. Uh, but you have the matrix A from last time, and it's on page two of your notes. The x vector is then a vector of x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. And what I want to start with in, in today's class, where we're going to just take this a little further, is we looked at the geometric interpretation here. And where I'm, I'm going with this is just to illustrate the algorithm's progress. And I'm not doing this because it's, um, we're, we're wanting to code this sort of thing up. I'm doing it because when the algorithm terminates, it presents you with some information using terminology that we're going to introduce here. And it's the interpretation of the GAMS output that is more critical for this course. Right? We're not trying to code up these algorithms. We're trying to use these algorithms. So we have to actually understand what the algorithms do so that when they finish, we can interpret the result. So we're starting over here at the point x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 0. And we said last class that if we did that, that point, when we set variables equal to 0, we call them non-basic. So. Let's just perhaps recap that we've got n, n variables. And of those, m are basic. And then the rest are non-basic. What do we mean by a basic variable? Well, the easiest is to just do it by, by exclusion. So the n minus m are non-basic variables non-basic variables have a value of 0. Okay. So at this particular iteration, let's just, uh, you might want to create sections in your notes, iteration 0, our starting point. At iteration 0, we have two non-basics and three basics. Because in this problem, <coughs> n is equal to 5, m is equal to 3. Three equations, so three equations, five variables. So therefore, we must have two non-basics and three basic variables. So my, my non-basic variables are the easiest ones to pick out. No, my non-basics are x1 equals 0 and x2 is equal to 0. That's my initial guess right down there in the corner. And therefore, by definition, my basis, i.e. my basic variables, are x3, x4, and x5. Those are the ones that are left over. And the reason why they're called a basis is because it's a linear algebra term that those three vectors for x3, x4, x5 define a basis for the linear space. So that's the reason why we call them basic, not because they're simple, but because they form a linear algebra base. And if you take a look at your AX equals B matrix, let's just uh, show it up here. It's on the bottom of, of uh, the second page of your handout. If you set x1 equals to 0, 
and x2 equals 0. So th those are my basis, are my non-basic variables. x3, 4, and 5 is my basis. If x1 and x2 are 0, you can delete these first two columns from the A matrix. They're not required anymore because anything multiplied by 0 is still 0. And then you're left with an identity matrix x3, x4, x5. I haven't s shown you what the other side is equal to. Ax is equal to b. You might want to add to your notes there equals to b. And b in this case is 1,500, 1,500. Okay. So Ax equals b there at the bottom of page 2. You can trivially solve that for x3, x4, x5. So in this case, x3 is equal to 1,500 x4 is equal to 1,000, and x5 is equal to 500. Now, we spent last class near the end saying, well, which way are we going to move in this system? We're at point zero down here. And we know that the simplex algorithm simply jumps from one corner point to the next, to the next, to the next. Well, how do I know to jump up to 1 and not jump across to 4? The rule is very, very straightforward. It's write the objective function in terms of your non-basic variables. Okay, so if we write our objective function in terms of our non-basic variables, it's in fact, it's already in that form for us. My non-basic variables are x1 and x2. And so the objective function is to maximize 10x1 plus 15x2. So I get the best increase in my objective function by changing x2, the coefficient of 15 is higher than 10. So this direction, by increasing x2, is a better search direction than going horizontally. Now, why this emphasis on basic and non-basic variables is quite simple. When we go from one point to the next, we have to give up a basis variable, and we have to exchange it with a non-basic variable. OK, so let's look at this visual. Uh, just write it out here visually. The next step here in my iteration is to exchange a basis, a basic and a non-basic variable. So if I write out my five variables that way, these two are non-basic. These three are basic. One of these basic variables has to go up here, and one of my non-basics has to come in. You always have to have that m are basic and n minus m are non-basic. That has to be fixed. So if you lose one basic variable, you have to exchange it with a non-basic. And if we're moving x2, right? so this is the important part. x2 is uh, over here right now. We're at 0, 0. If x2 moves up, x2 is going to go larger. By definition, x2 now is going to become non-zero and because a non-basic variable must be 0, x2 is the one leaving and coming down here. Okay. So x2 will be the one to leave. It's got to, right? Because non-basic variables, by definition, are equal to 0. I'm making x2 larger. I'm making x2 positive. Well, it's got to come down here. Something, one of these three, has to give and exchange its role. Which one will it be? It's going to be x3, x4, or x5. OK? x5. The rule is 
easy to see geometrically. Computers have a harder time doing this. I've put the algorithm that a computer would follow there in your notes in the new handout. I don't really care to go through that. Geometrically is what I do care to go through and make sure that you understand. X2 is increasing. Which of those three constraints is it going to hit first? Inspection, soldering, or placement? It's going to hit inspection first. So as X2 rises up, it's going to hit that constraint first. The soldering constraint is off the page. The placement constraint is even further up the page still. Okay. Why do I make a big deal of which constraint it's going to hit? When it hits the inspection constraint, what happens to x5? Zero. zero. OK, so there's our answer. x5 now has become zero, and it moves in over there. Okay. So we can write this then, iteration At iteration one, my basic variables are which three? Which three are my basic variables at point one? So x3 was there before, x4 was there before, and now x2 also comes in. My non-basics are the two that are zero x5 is 0, and which other one is 0? x1, OK. So this point over here is defined by x1 equals 0. That's correct. And x5 is equal to 0. That's also correct. We're right on that line. So those are my two non-basics. x3, x4, and x2 are my basics. Everyone see that? Everyone clear on that? Yes? x5 goes to 0 because it's on the constraint. And when we started this class, we said any, any variable, any slack variable that's on a constraint is 0. But that's why I recapped the class at that important point. Slack variables that are on their constraint have a value of 0. They're called active, and that slack then is 0. So x5 is 0, x1 is 0. Yes, clear? No. OK, good. So now that that's clear, solve ax equals b with the three new basic variables. So I'll give you a minute to solve for that. So solve ax equals b for the three basic variables. In other words, I'm looking for the value of x3, x4, and x2. OK, so what's the value then of x2, x3, and x4? We can solve this quite easily because we see that x1 is equal to 0, x5 is equal to 0. So that immediately deletes this entire column from consideration and that column from consideration. So you solve a linear system in three variables. The easiest one to solve for, of course, is x2 over here. 
That last equation says 8 times x2 is equal to 500. So your value then for x2, 62.5. Okay. Solve for x3. By subbing in, I get a value of 250. And x4, sorry, I messed it up. This is x4, right? No, I, I had that right. Sorry, x2. I was right, yeah. What's value of x4, sir? I just don't have my calculator here. Yeah. Sorry, uh, We just explained that from the prior iteration. At point number one, x5 is equal to 0, x1 is equal to 0. Sorry? It's just they're non basic. x5 is a slack variable, it's 0. X1 is just a regular variable, it's 0. No. Yeah. The variables will change roles as we move through here. They'll either become basic or non basic. We're not concerned whether they're slacks or non slacks right now. We, s we created slack variables at the beginning of our problems. Then these slack variables, x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, just become regular variables after that point. Mark? We're only doing the iterations for like extreme points where we have two constraints, right? We're not actually on line. So We're just looking at extreme points on the bounds of the feasible region. I think uh, X4 is actually 250. Okay, sorry. And X4 is, uh, X3 is? 875. 875. Okay, thank you. There was a, yeah, okay. So x2, 62 and a half looks right. I mean, I've drawn, the, drawn it geometrically here for you. Where that intersects over there, x2 looks to be about 62 and a half. So that's a, another double, a double check for us. OK, so we're, we're not quite complete here yet. We're at this point, And now we've got to ask ourselves where to move next. Or is that point perhaps the optimum? Right? How do we know? And here's how we check, check that. We rewrite our objective function. You're going to hear me say this again. I said this earlier when we were down here. Now we're up here. We just keep repeating the algorithm. We rewrite our objective function in terms of the non-basic variables. What are our non-basic variables? x1 and x5. So can we rewrite our objective function in terms of x1 and x5? If we look at our objective function, it's 10x1. That's OK. There's a non-basic variable. But x2 is a small problem. The easiest way to get rid of x2 is to recognize that we're on that constraint over there. 4x1 plus 8x2 x5 is equal to 0, so I can just ignore that, is equal to 500. So I can rewrite that active constraint in terms of x1 on the right hand side and x2 on the left hand side. So it's rearranged for x2 is equal to 500 over 8 minus 4 over 8 times x1. This is all in the notes in um, the new handout. The detailed algorithm is given to you, right, just verbally. We're working through it here. Yes, Mark? Where is the 4x1 plus x2? Which equation is that? It's this constraint. We're, uh, we're oh, the right? Okay. So we're right at that point. So that line is active. This is why active constraints are so critical. No, we're just trying to rewrite the objective function in terms of the non-basics. Right. So to do that, I have to get rid of x2. Right. So, but why would you write like x2 equals 500 over 8 minus 4 over 8 x1 minus x1? Okay. So 
you'll see now when, when I sub in where this is going, yeah? OK? Yeah? You said you have to write in terms of the non basic, but is it the non basic changes every time you write? That's right, yeah. So, yeah, the non basic is go about to change, and we're going to see that. Right, remember, the reason why I want to write the objective in terms of non-basics is that non-basics will become our next move. Right? They're going to move away from zero to become non-zero. Okay, so you'll see now when I sub in what happens here. Um, sub that in, you'll get your revised objective function looking as follows. Uh, I just have to look it up here on my notes. So sub in your objective function is equal to 2.5x1 plus 875. Sorry, no, I'm reading the wrong, wrong line here. Plus uh, 937.5. Okay, so for those of you that can't see it on the other side, your objective function is 2.5x1 plus 937.5. Yeah? OK, so the question is then, which direction do we move? Do we go, remember, if you're thinking of a pure algorithm, a pure algorithm is sitting here and saying, which direction do I go in next? Either it goes back to where it started off, and we know that's not going to do us any good. We're going to decrease our objective doing that. Or we move along this vertex, that line. And what I've rewritten over here indicates how the objective function varies along that line. Right now, x1 is equal to 0. So currently, my objective at that top corner is 937.5. This shows me that if I increase x1, there's a positive coefficient, increasing x1 will lead to an improved optimum. So I should move along that line. How far do we move? The objective. OK. So I've rewritten my objective in terms of the non-basic variables, x1 and x5. The question is, which of those variables do I change? In this case, I only have x1 in there. And because it's a positive coefficient, 2 and a half x1, it indicates to increase x1. So I'm increasing x1, and that equation tells me how the objective function value will adjust as I move along that line. Every one unit that I increase x1 by, I'll increase my profit by $2.5. Okay. My base profit at the corner is 937.5. Every one unit of x that I move along here will increase profit by $2.5. But I've got to stop somewhere, right? I can't just keep going along that line. Eventually, I'm going to hit into one of my other constraints. And that's all that the simplex algorithm is doing, right? This is what I really hope you get from this, is that the simplex algorithm is just bouncing from one active set of constraints to the other active set of constraints to the next set of active constraints. And it keeps going as long as that objective function keeps rising, right? We've proved mathematically that we only have to visit corner points. So as long as we just keep visiting corner points and as long as our values keep going up, we just keep going. Joseph. This question may expose some uh, misunderstanding on my part, but what if, you, what if you go, you're increasing, you're increasing, you're increasing, and then all of a sudden you hit a constraint where you decrease, but on the other side, there's like an even better point. You know what I'm trying to ask? Like right. It can't possibly be for a linear system. Yeah, linear systems by definition are univariately rising. You can't have an even better optimum over the other side of the hill. That, we'll get to that after the midterm break. We'll look at nonlinear functions which have humps. There could be better stuff on the other side. But linear systems by definition have a smooth slope, always rising. Yeah. OK, so we're seeing here rewriting the objective function that way, that we're going to just have to increase x1 up to when we reach our next constraints.
So let's come back to answering this question that we've looked at before. Which of my non-basic variables is going to become basic? I'm currently here. This is iteration one. Which of my non-basic variables are going to become basic? X1, OK? X1 is going to become basic because I'm moving it away from 0. So this is going to come into this category. Which of my basic variables are going to become non-basic? X4, OK? So X4 is going to be the constraint that it hits into. We know that at a constraint, that slack x4 must be 0. So x4 is going to be 0 and move into this region. OK, so let's update my list over here for iteration 2. My basic variables are x2, x3, and now x1 gets added. So let's just write that x1, x2, x3. And my non-basics are x4 and x5. OK, now, like last time, we have to go solve AX equals B. Solve AX equals B in terms of X1, X2, and X3. So I'm going to clean this up a bit. 16. And so x1, x2, x3 is what I'm seeking a solution for. You don't have to write this down um, unless you really want to. But essentially, we know that x4 and x5 are my non-basics. By definition, non-basics are 0. So x4 goes out of consideration. x5 goes out of consideration. And I solve that system of equations for x1, x2, and x3. So x1 is equal to 62.5 at that solution. x2 is equal to 31.25. And x3 here is equal to 187.5. Okay, so I'm not expecting you to solve this one quickly in class. Okay. And because x4 and x5 are non-basic, we know that they're 0. OK, so we've essentially done a full iteration here. If you've got the handout that I've just uh, put out in the front of the class, we've essentially gone through the algorithm steps A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Okay, so I'd like you to, when, we, when you go home and, and review this material tonight, look at what we've just covered in class in the context of those, those iterations. Right, and make sure that you can understand and reproduce the steps we've taken. Step E is the hardest step to describe. It's easy to describe it geometrically. Step E is the step that says, when we're moving along this line, which constraint becomes active first? Right? So in this case, x4 becomes active first. Let me do, just do another example for you. If you're at point number 2 and you're moving along this line, which constraint becomes active first? The one involving x3, the placement constraint. Okay. Now computers obviously don't look at it visually. And so I've written out what a computer would do to figure out that answer. And that's only for those of you that are really interested in understanding what that's hap what's happening there. But I don't, it's not really part of this course. Uh, 
do that. All I want you to get from this class today is the idea of moving around from vertex to vertex and the crucial idea of basic variables changing their roles with non-basic variables. Okay? So that's described in detail in the handout there in front of you. Any questions on that so far? Yeah. Over here, yeah. Okay, so the question is, why don't we visit this point out over here? It's outside of the feasible region. But the feasible region is this side of the constraints. So that's beyond the feasible region. Yeah. Okay, but that's a, that's a crucial, important point. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, can you write a new objective function for the round? Because I'm just confused about where you said that the objective function only has a non-distributed Okay. Yeah, OK. So then the question, uh, remember how earlier I rewrote the objective function in terms of the non-basic variables? That's hard to do when you're at the optimum this way. When a computer does it, there's a very easy trigger that the computer senses when it's at the optimum. At this, when you're at the optimum, you can't write your objective function in terms of the non-basic variables. And that's how you know you've terminated at the optimum. Okay. In fact, your objective function at that point becomes a constant number. Okay, so your objective function, let me just uh, perhaps put it this way for you. If you had to rewrite this one, and I, I don't expect you to do this, um, your objective function at the optimum, written in terms of the non-basic variables, is equal to 1093.75 plus 0 times x4 plus 0 times x5. Okay, That's how the computer knows to terminate. Because when written in terms of the non-basic variables, the coefficients are 0. So it says increasing x4 or decreasing x4, sorry, you can only increase, right? Increasing x4 or increasing x5 has no effect on the objective. Therefore, you must be at the optimum. It will stop. It won't, it won't even go over there to verify that that point's lower. It, it, by definition, the theorems for linear programming tell us that we have to be at the optimum. There's no better point than that. OK, but that's, I don't want to go into the, the mathematical details of that. It's not hard. It's just not the focus of my course here. Okay. What I do want to focus on now is just to explore a little bit more about that optimum. Right? When the algorithm terminates, we want to understand a little bit more about what that optimum point tells us. So let's go take a look at that for a little bit. And I'm going to take the board up here so we can just write this algebraically. OK, so the key characteristic that a computer simplex implementation looks for is that there's no more improvement possible by varying the non-basic variables. OK, so when this algorithm terminates, we have two non-basic variables, x4 and x5. And the computer has a very easy way of subbing in those active constraints to write the objective function in terms of x4 and x5. We found it very confusing here in class. Right, so remember that discussion 15 minutes ago where I wrote the objective function in terms of x1? Very confusing. It didn't seem like, why would you do this? Computers have just a routine mathematical way of subbing in the non-basics and calculating the objective function. And what the objective function would look like for the computer is what I have up here on the board. 1093 plus 0 times x4 plus 0 times x5. So there's no possible improvement by varying those non-basic variables. Algorithm ends. It spits out the solution to you in GAMS, and you're done. 
Now what do we do next? Well, we go look at that solution. At that solution, notice what we have. We solved ax equals b, and here's the interesting stuff. x1 is 62 and a half, x2 is 31.25. Take a look at that on your diagram. So in this example, does it look like it corresponds to point 0.2? You can do this by hand, but it's super tedious. I, why bother, right? You guys are fourth years. We have calculators doing it. We don't need to be wasting our time reproducing what computers do quite adequately for us. Okay, So I want us to spend time interpreting the result. So in this example, x1 is equal to 62 and a half. x2 is equal to 31.25. That tells you how many units of A to produce and how many units of B to produce. Okay. Now here's a little problem. People have been picking up on this occasionally. These are not integers. You can't produce 31.25 circuit boards or 62 and a half circuit boards. So we always do this in linear programming. You simply round down or round to stay feasible. So you would produce 62 circuit boards of type A and 31 circuit boards of type B. Okay? Because you obviously can't produce half a circuit board or a quarter circuit board. Let's take a look at x3, x4, x5. They also tell us some interesting things. And the, way, the easiest way to see that is let's go look at the constraints. Let's go verify that the computer did what we had asked it to. The constraint recall was 16x1 plus 10x2 less than or equal to 1,500. Sub in the values of x1 and x2. Okay, so sub in x1 and x2. And you'll get the following, 1312.5 Okay. And that's less than or equal to 1,500. So we know that that constraint was met. Okay. Let me rewrite that constraint now in terms of the, act, the slack variables. We had plus x3 is equal to 1,500. Okay. So if I write it in this way, I can say plus x3 is equal to 1,500. I can solve for x3. And no surprise, you get 187.5, which is what we got there earlier. What does that number mean? It's feasible, OK. The fact that it's non-zero means that this constraint is active or inactive? Inactive. inactive, OK. So if I write it back in constraint form again, it says that this is inactive. How are you going to interpret that to your boss? Sorry? Placement doesn't matter, yeah? It's a redundant constraint. It's a redundant constraint. Placement doesn't matter. All of those things are roughly equivalent. The easiest way to see it is that you've got no resources constraints at the placement station. Remember, the placement station says it takes 16 minutes to produce part A, 10 minutes to produce part B, and you've only got 1,500 minutes. When you sub in and you get this 13125, it says that at your optimum, you're only going to use 1,312 minutes at that station. You've got spare capacity. You've got slack at the station. You've got 187 spare minutes to use at that station. Yeah, Brandon? You could fire some at the placement station. You could produce a third product at that placement station. You've got extra capacity. 
Okay, you've got unused resources, however it interprets in your particular example. No, if you round it up, you would violate the constraint. Right? If you sub in 63, you're going to be above one of the constraints. Remember how our region, you had to move down inside it. Yeah, no. Uh, just to recap, so numerically, it means that we have 187 minutes spare. Spare at the placement station. At the optimum, yeah. So at, yeah, we're only investigating the optimum. Yeah. So you've got 187 spare minutes at the placement station. Let's take a look at the other constraint, just do we have any time left? No. Nope. Okay. So sub in the constraint for x4 and x5 and interpret that, and we'll take that up next class. I didn't answer your question. 